So I have a title for my message this morning, and it's, it's quite catchy. It's like, it's, the title is Don't Go There. All right, Don't Go There. Now, do you, I'm sure you've all experienced one of those family get-togethers when everyone's there around the table and everyone's eating, and someone says something, and everyone's eyes are like, just the eyes say it all, don't go there. You know what I mean? Or someone asks a question, what's going on with that, or what happened to that person, or who there, or what, what, and everyone's just like, we don't go there. <laughs> or someone just says that one thing that everyone just looks down and carries eating on eating their food, because we're just not going there. You know, especially in this family, we don't go there. But have you ever noticed that there are areas in our own lives where we subconsciously or consciously or even verbally say, just don't go there? How's your marriage doing? Don't go there. (laughs) How are things at work? Don't go there. How's your business doing? Oh, don't go there. How are you managing your teenage kids? Definitely don't go there. How are you doing financially? Don't go there. How's your relationship with so-and-so going? Don't go there. How's that job? Uh, uh, What's it like having three kids under three? Don't go there. (laughs) How's that job application going? Don't go there. Now, I want you to close your eyes and think about your don't go there areas. This is homework. This is an we are participating in this message this morning. So close your eyes. You shouldn't have to go very far <laughs> to know what your go, don't go there areas are. But close your eyes and just imagine what are your don't go there areas in your own life. Okay, you can open your eyes. I mustn't move around, hey? Am I right? Okay. Okay, so the point I want to make this morning is this. Sometimes we have, we just live in those don't go there zones. And I really believe that that is exactly where the Father, through his Holy Spirit, wants us to go. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes we live and hide behind our don't go there zones. But I really believe that the Father, through the Holy Spirit, That's exactly where he wants us to go because of the work he wants to do in us. So let's look at an example from the life of Jesus. So in Matthew 3, verse 13, we have the scripture. This is the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus, Jesus replied, let it be so now, it is proper, proper for us to do this, to fulfill, fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. The baptism of Jesus the Holy Spirit comes and fills, comes upon Jesus and fills his life. And then the next verse, then, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to his don't go there. Just after he was baptized, he led him into that place that was really uncomfortable and hard and difficult. The Spirit led him there. Now let's look at another example from the early church in Acts 1, verse 4 to 8. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then, okay, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to do it at at this time, going to restore the kingdom to Israel, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority. This is actually the scripture, the point here. But you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the utter parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and the first thing they have to do is go and be witnesses. Now, being a witness in those days was not something you signed up for. It was the, We don't go there. We don't go there. We don't go and tell people about Jesus because they got persecuted. Being a witness to Jesus Christ became closely associated with martyrdom in the early years of the church. The bodies of the early Christians were persecuted and literally given as a living sacrifice and testimony of God. You really did not want to be a witness for Jesus Christ in those days. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them to go to their don't go there place. Is this making sense? And then Stephen, let's, let's look at what happened to Stephen after being a witness for Jesus. Acts 7, verse 54. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. This is Stephen. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their eyes and yelling at the top of the voices, they rushed at him dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Jesus prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And then he basically died. They stoned him to death. The Holy Spirit came upon him to be a witness, even to being stoned to death. That was a bad don't go there place to be in if that was you. Okay, are you all with me? Okay. Now think about those don't go there areas again. No matter how awkward or hurtful or neglected or desperate and impossible they may appear, and imagine that the Holy Spirit actually wants to lead us into those areas to help us to sort them out. Okay, are you with us? So you're imagining those areas. So the Holy Spirit actually wants to go in to those don't go there areas and help us sort them out. All right, now I want you to have another picture. If I had to ask you a picture of the Holy Spirit, what would you think if you give me a picture of the Holy Spirit? Just in your mind, like we've heard of the Holy Spirit and we have this like idea of who he is, we've read about him. But if you had a, like a little picture of whenever I refer to the Holy Spirit, this is my picture that I have. So it might be like a little tinkerbell. It might be like a little match striking with some fire. It might be like a friendly ghost, Casper the friendly ghost. Everyone has a different picture. Okay. And so what I want to do now is I want to show you a video. We're doing with the youth next door. We're doing a series on the Holy Spirit from the Youth Alpha course. And there's a beautiful little clip that I want to show you to help us to create the right picture of who the Holy Spirit is. Okay, so I'm leading you on a journey. Are you all journeying with me? You haven't got off the bus yet? All right. So I'm hoping to replace maybe a lesser, less powerful picture of who the Holy Spirit is with something that is much more real for us. So I'm going to ask Grace to play the video. It's going to cut in a little bit in the video, and then it will... The gift of the Holy Spirit, who once came upon particular people at particular times for particular purposes is now for every one of us. One of the Greek words that the New Testament writers use to describe the Holy Spirit is parakletos, and it means the one who comes alongside. It's sometimes translated the advocate, the one who comes alongside to defend you. Sometimes the encourager, the one who comes alongside to encourage. Sometimes the comforter or helper. The word literally means the one called alongside. For example, when a small ship got in trouble on the Mediterranean Sea, they would send a big ship to draw alongside it to lead it to the safety of the harbor. And that big ship was called the Paracletos. Thank you. So that big ship, you see that little ship in the harbor? That big ship that came alongside it. Okay. So as we saw, Paracletos is a fancy word for the, for the Holy Spirit, but it describes him in a multifaceted way. It calls him the advocate, the encourager, the comforter, the helper, the one who comes alongside. 
we actually live with this huge God-given advantage in the person of his Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at who the Holy Spirit is. I've just got a few scriptures. John 16 verse 7 says, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is our helper, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. He's our helper. Number two, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. 1 Corinthians. No, this is not... Uh Uh-uh. I'm going to read it off the scriptures. Okay. Sorry, Grace. So the Holy Spirit is our helper. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6. Number three, he makes us more like Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So he makes us more like Jesus. Number four, he helps us to do the Father's will. In Acts 8, the Spirit said to Peter, go up and join the chariot of the, the eunuch. He helps us, he guides us in the specifics to do God's will. In number, number five, the Holy Spirit gifts us for ministry. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who works, who does the work in all of us. So the Holy Spirit gifts us for ministry. Number six, he imparts love. Not only that, in Romans 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. We, that's what we were singing this morning, to mention that cascading love of the Father through the Holy Spirit. Number seven, Romans 15 says the Holy Spirit gives us hope and empowers us. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Number eight, John 14 says the Holy Spirit teaches and gives insight. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And number nine, my last one, he guides our prayers. In Romans 8, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And I just want to add, as we sang this morning again, the Holy Spirit leads us into the loving, open arms and embrace of the eternal Father God. Holy Spirit leads us, he empowers us, he teaches us, he helps us to pray, he gifts us, he sanctifies us, he helps us. Okay, you all with me? There's a much bigger picture of the Holy Spirit than I think sometimes we have. Can we put that picture of the boat up again, please? All right, so there's that little boat, that's us on the waters. And there's the Holy Spirit coming alongside us. I really think that our greatest stumbling block is fear. What if it gets really ugly or messy or uncomfortable or makes me look stupid? How do I confront my boss to tell him that I am unhappy with the way things are being done? How do I break free from this addiction that keeps consuming me? How do I sort out the mess that my marriage has become? How do I forgive that person that hurt me so many years ago? 
How do I navigate this season of being a father to my young kids or to my complicated teenagers? Teenagers aren't complicated. They're actually just so lovely. <laughs> I just, we just think they are. How do I love the person who I have fallen out of love with? How do I pray when I just don't want to believe anymore? How do I learn to trust in a father that never even seems to see me? Let's read what the Apostle Paul wrote about this in Timothy, the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Another version of this passage says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And I've always wondered why those three, why love and power and self-discipline? There's obviously this cocktail, this mixture of these three things that are the key to going into those don't go there areas by the help of the Spirit because it's his power, his love, and his self-control in us that helps us to do this. In the Passion Translation, it says, for God will never give you the spirit of fear, because that's what fear often, I don't want to go into that place because I'm scared of what that's going to be. I know what's behind there. I don't want to go there. It's much more kind of easier to keep the door closed, locked, throw away the key, than to go in there because it's scary. It's messy. It's uncomfortable. But God says, I, don't, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit, but I've given you the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self control. And these are the keys, these are the areas, the keys to sorting out those don't go to areas His power, His love, and His self control. In the Amplified Version, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice. Of fear, but he has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well balanced mind and self control. Beautiful. Is that not exactly what we need to go into those don't go there areas? It is the Holy Spirit who gives us the power, the love, the discipline. And I believe even the courage, the desire, and the strength to face and to overcome the things that we are afraid of. We don't have to avoid and ignore them anymore. It is the Holy Spirit who helps and encourages and comforts and leads us. It is the Holy Spirit who is a true friend, the one who comes right alongside us to help us navigate the journey ahead. He doesn't take the rough sea away. All right, that's what we all wait for. Take my don't go to their thing away. He doesn't take it away. He doesn't take the toughness of the situation away. He just helps to navigate us to the other side, to the place, to a destination, to a place of safety, to a place of victory. And I love this when we were singing this morning. I called, I called, you answered, and you came to my rescue. And I want to be where you are. And I just, as we were singing that, I just had this picture in my mind. There's us on this boat, on this thing, and it's rough, and it's, it's, it's messy. And we feel alone. And we call, and God sends his Holy Spirit to come alongside us, to rescue us, and to take us to where he is. I called, and you came to my rescue. You called, I called, you answered, you came to my rescue, and you took me to where you are. Beautiful, eh? Beautiful, it's such a beautiful picture that we can always remember that picture and with the words that we were singing this morning. It is the, uh, where we now? Um, he, yeah, he doesn't take the situation away. He helps us to navigate to the other side, 
to a final destination, a place of safety and a place of victory. It is really up to us how much we take advantage of this awesome privilege of having the Holy Spirit, the Paracletos, to help us and to come alongside us. If we learn to look to him and lean upon him more, we will gain more from his help. If we choose to go on with our, li- on with our lives without looking to him, then he- we will do it without his help. He won't force himself and his help upon us. We need to learn to trust in the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it's not a quick fix. It's not a welcome to the Holy Spirit. Can I take your order, please? (laughs) For a drive-through happy meal. Sometimes we wish it was, hey? Welcome to the Holy Spirit. Can I take your order, please? Well, how long have you got? I've got my, this is my checklist with, a, with extra dipping sauce. Because um, then I get a happy meal at, at the end of it and a toy. All right, it's not a quick fix. It's not a drive through. It's also not a hey Google or a hey Siri or even a hey Alexa as the Americans have. Hey Google. But maybe it can at least start with a, hey, Holy Spirit. Hey, Holy Spirit. Listen, this thing's tough. This this thing's messy. This thing's been with me for too long. Come and rescue me. Take me to the other side. Come, Holy Spirit. Hey, Holy Spirit. Maybe it can start with a, hey, Holy Spirit, followed by a genuine longing and desire for the Holy Spirit to come and to work in us, in our situation, in our fears, and to help us through safely to the other side. In closing, I believe that the Holy Spirit genuinely wants to help us if we allow him to. As we imagine that big ship coming alongside us, negotiating the way ahead, encouraging us to keep moving forward, comforting us in the process, and helping us safely to the other side, if we will allow him to. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Tim.